It's a disaster film, but not a disaster of a film. I sure hope that fire's on the first floor! For a time in the 70s, disaster movies were the biggest films in town, and this film's success towered over all others like some sort of very tall structure that was perhaps a little more combustible than was absolutely ideal. Architects. Yeah, it's all our fault. The Towering Inferno. in the tower, is there? Movies had often chased a spectacle as a way to get bums on seats. Disaster movies combined spectacle with thrills and a touch of respectable horror. You may not have been able to hold down your lunch while watching The Exorcist or sit through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre with just one change of pants. Well, we got a fire here! But with a disaster movie, you could be at peace with the fact that the often natural phenomenon flattening your town wasn't being at all malicious or personal. Well, it kind of feels personal. There were films about natural disasters, man-made disasters, disasters where giant monsters ran amok, or alien invasions, which also happened to conveniently lay waste to cities. That part was important since laying waste to something like a desert was about as exciting as counting out the individual grains of rice when you don't have a measuring cup. The big thing about disaster films was that they needed believable special effects in order to sell the sense of doom. Of course, as time wore on, the baseline for what constituted a believable special effect would be continually raised. Oh, now just how bad is it? It's a fire, mister, and all fires are bad. The world's tallest building in San Francisco is about to be officially opened, with the builder, William Holden, throwing a fancy party to celebrate. Look, there are so many characters here that I'm just going to use the well-known actors' names, since that's basically what most viewers would see. Paul Newman is the building's architect, about to go on to a new job, while he has a Nuna in his office with his fiancée, Faye Dunaway. It's perhaps a pity he forgot to turn off his dictaphone, since later on his secretary would have to type up the letter he had half-finished and sent on to his new employer. An electrical fault sends Newman after William Holden's son-in-law, Richard Chamberlain, who's gone for lower-cost materials than Newman had specified. As you've been screwing around with the electrical specification, being rather blunt, isn't it? Yeah, I know, it's riveting so far. PR man Robert Wagner is also having it off with his secretary. I mean, the cleaners in this building must have some stories to tell with all and sundry having it off in the building. It's less towering inferno and more a 138-story love shack. The party gets started on the 81st floor. Fred Astaire is a con man looking to fleece a woman that he falls in love with. A deaf mother with two children is living in the building. Robert Vaughan is a senator. O.J. Simpson is a security guard. A little fire starts and pretty soon Fire Chief Steve McQueen shows up to butt heads with the building's management, blaming Paul Newman for designing these buildings without ever talking to a fireman. Sprinklers are not working on 81. Why not? I don't know. After setting up the character situations and who dislikes who for what basic reason and who's doing who for what basic reason and who you're going to be happy to see char-grilled and whose tragic fate will be a total bummer. The fire gets going and every safety feature of the building fails. It's a pretty pissly looking fire for a while with the firemen needing their chief to tell them where to point the hose. The fire soon spreads and people start dying, either by being burned up or falling to their doom, or if they're really unlucky, falling to their doom while on fire. It's not a particularly explicit film, but still fairly scary. Yes, you can tell the people on fire are stunt people wearing bulky fireproof suits, but it's still unpleasant to look at, unless your kink is, of course, watching people burn to death, or falling to death, or if you're really sick, bungee roast. For what it's worth, architect, this is one building that I figured wouldn't burn. Neither did I. Someone has a daring plan for a rescue, and then that falls apart faster than this cheap balsa wood office chair I'm using. Ah! My dignity! They attempt to ferry passengers off the roof via chopper, and then that goes pear-shaped. Then they use a breeches boy to winch people across to another building, but because Richard Chamberlain's character was such a shit, that plan goes south much like Richard Chamberlain's character. One working elevator got halfway down when an explosion complicates things even further. The sweet old lady who Fred Astaire was going to fleece but then fell in love with and who also saved the deaf woman and her kids falls to her doom. So the moral of the story of The Towering Inferno is that while all of the asshole characters die, it's not exclusively the asshole characters who die. 
The film will split up its characters with mainly Newman or McQueen leading a different rescue attempt. Paul Newman leads some folk down a destroyed stairwell. Steve McQueen hooks on a cable from a chopper to save those trapped in the glass elevator. The film's big plan, with so many people still trapped, blow up some water tanks and have people tie themselves down to something so they're not carried away by the water. How are they gonna get the explosives up here? Oh, they'll find some dumb son of a bitch to bring it up. The plan works, and so then we can tote up who lives and who dies. Body counts less than 200. You know, one of these days, you're gonna kill 10,000 in one of these fire traps. Dead, living, dead, living, 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 dead, 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 living, living, dead, and so on. All up under 200 people apparently died, but many of them were extras, so don't worry too much. Steve McQueen tells Paul Newman his dream of a fireproof building. And I'm gonna keep eating smoke and bringing out body until somebody ask us how to build them. Realistically though, even though Newman's plans were downgraded by Richard Chamberlain's character, I don't have to take crap from you. Just as gravity did to Richard Chamberlain's character, <laughs> who in their right mind is going to hire the architect behind the towering inferno to design a building for them? Also, the name he might choose to emphasize the fire safety aspects, Asbestos Towers, might also be a red flag. Okay. The early 70s saw an uptick in disaster films of various types. Epic films had fallen out of favor with many of them, even films we now consider classics, having lost money for their studios faster than a pension fund manager who's itching to try out his new infallible system at the roulette tables in Las Vegas. Airport in 1970 provided a template of sorts with an all-star cast dealing with their own little issues against the backdrop of a potential disaster. Big stars and some soap opera level interpersonal dramas would prove to be the magic formula that defined many of the 70s biggest disaster movie hits. Films filled with archetypes, so you don't need to know the character's name so much as their role. We have the architect, the fireman, guy having an affair, smarmy guy who cuts corners, the cat, etc. The 1970s saw the rise of new Hollywood, young filmmakers making edgy material, while disaster films showed creaky old Hollywood fighting back. Big movie stars, quite often just on the other side of their career peak, showing up in huge numbers that helped fill out movie posters with recognisable faces. Irwin Allen had started off producing movies, then became known as a purveyor of sci-fi shows on TV, with Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Lost in Space, Land of the Giants and The Time Tunnel. But after those series ended, there was a new area of fantasy that Allen could explore, the disaster film. He produced the 1972 disaster movie The Poseidon Adventure, with a lot owed to airport, except in Allen's film they didn't avert disaster, but instead focused on survivors making their escape. The film made a ton of cash at the box office and so Alan got to work on an even bigger film based on a fire in a skyscraper. Alan's screenwriter from Poseidon Adventure, Sterling Siliphant, took elements from two separate books and gave us the story of the world's tallest building catching fire after the builder had cut corners during construction. Builders cutting corners seems to be a genre in itself. Of course, as the producer of Lost in Space, Land of the Giants, etc., Alan himself was no stranger to squares that suddenly became octagons. Towering Inferno, directed by John Gilliman, gives us an overall story. Every piece of wire I put in that building is strictly up to code, inspected and approved. The code's not enough for that building. And you know it. That's why I asked for installations that were way, way above standard. Buddy, you live in a dream world. I deal in reality. <laughs> and then concentrates for long stretches on an individual hurdle some characters have to overcome. It gives characters gut punch after gut punch after rescue attempts fail left, right and centre. It's almost a comedy of errors. It's quite good, thrilling, but grim and not a barrel of laughs. It's really all right. I don't know why they just didn't call International Rescue, but there you go. Most of the special effects hold up relatively well and the deaths are quite chilling. I'll be honest, I'm not wanting to go into a tall building anytime soon, especially ones where Richard Chamberlain's character was in charge of procurement. <laughs> Towering Inferno was the most successful of the 1970s wave of disaster films. The latter part of the 70s saw more and more attempts to mine the genre, with more airport films than there are actual airports. 
With the one-two punch of Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno under his belt, producer Irwin Allen had well and truly earned the unironic nickname, The Master of Disaster. His attempts to build on that success included directing a Poseidon Adventure sequel and The Swarm, a critically derided flop about a giant swarm of killer bees, which may have flipped Irwin Allen's nickname somewhat. Shit. These films often saw the same actors appearing in multiple movies in different roles, though George Kennedy would play the same role in the airport movies. Michael Caine is in a few, Charlton Heston is in a few, Robert Wagner isn't in the Poseidon Adventure movies for some reason. But I am not going to concern myself with a fire in a storage room on 81 because it can't possibly affect us up here. Towering Inferno was a film I hadn't seen before and it surprised me with how well it's held up in places. One of the weakest weak spots was it has one of the most forgettable scores by John Williams that I've ever heard. If the film had been made 15 to 20 years later, we may have gotten one of those alternate soundtracks with music inspired by the movie. Stamfine Records, songs that aren't in the towering inferno but vaguely linked to it. 21 hits that have a spurious link to a movie about a burning building, including Burn For You, Disco Inferno, Smoke On The Water, Great Balls Of Fire, We Didn't Start The Fire, Ring Of Fire, I'm On Fire, Just Like Fire, Fight Fire With Fire, Light My Fire, This Wheel's On Fire, and more. Jeez, how low effort is this? The acting is generally of a decent standard, but no one's acting their heart out, despite the film occasionally leaning towards melodrama in places. This was a paycheck for most, rather than anybody's passion project. Ah, but that's the way of entertainment. Do you want to see stars and less well-known but still vaguely familiar character actors dealing with adversity, screaming, burning and looking concerned? But really, do you want to shit your pants every time you get into an elevator in a high-rise building? I don't, but I have. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.